Greetings, Moonlight Citizens. This is your man on the moon coming to you live with the first ever episode of Moonlight Kingdom Reviews. And on this episode, we'll be reviewing the 1980 William Friedkin-directed Al Pacino starring movie, Cruising. Yeah, this movie has um, a lot of controversy to it. Well, back in the day, the, there were various groups who in within the LGBT community who didn't want it to get made because well the movie's about a killer who's hunting down people of the like members of the LGBT of the gay community in New York and you can kind of see why they wouldn't want that kind of thing out there you don't want a movie that essentially you have a guy going out and killing people of that community so yeah plus it delves into S&M life back then yeah, and they didn't want people portraying that on screen, especially when the movie was being directed by the director of the freaking Exorcist. So, yeah, that was um. So there was apparently all this story about how all these stories of how when the film was shooting in Greenwich Village, people would yell like they would protest, they would be like m try and mess with the productions so much so that um they had to tape over stuff. Like, they would use the footage they shot, but they didn't use the sound because you couldn't hear anything. And they had to tape over it in, like, post-production or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie got a lot of controversy behind it. But, like, that's 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 not why I'm reviewing this. I'm reviewing it because it's, it's kind of an oddity when you kind of think, when you look at it. I mean, looking at Al Pacino's whole career and the kind of movies he's been in, you see cruising here and you're like, huh. Like, this is... Uh, this is a bit of an odd one. I mean, you think of Al Pacino, you see movies like Dog Day Afternoon, The Godfather, and, you know, just a whole bunch of other films before you get to this, so this is here. But, like, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm about to dive into it, so... This is Moonlight Kingdom Reviews. We're going to review for cruising. Here we go. Okay, the, um, the basic premise is this. The dead bodies have been turning up in places in new york like you know uh oh yeah body parts are washing up and also people have been found like dead in their apartments and so on like prominent cruising locations there's a serial killer on the loose and he's killing gay people members you know he's killing gay people the um that's the simpson movie so the police come up with the genius idea of sending in a cop undercover to like find out who's doing this he's, he's killing you know you know the oh wait wait yeah he's killing people who are into leather bondage and you know stuff like that there's body parts randomly being found all over town and the cops think both events are being done by the same guy all the victims kind of look the same so they send in a rookie cop undercover who matches the description of the villains to see if he can bait out the killer that's cliche, you know, that's typical, you know, undercover movie shit. Like, oh yeah, he's, uh, there's a serial killer on the loose. He's killing a certain type of person. We need to send in a certain type of person to root him out. You know, basic stuff with a twist. Thing is, the killer's killing gay people, members of the S&M community. So we need you to go undercover there. Better than your typical undercover story of like, go undercover, pretend to be a criminal or some shit like that. You know. It's this. It's a cliche premise for movie, uh, movies, cop movies, and thrillers to go down, but it's a twist because of where it, it takes. It's said, okay. The first kill in this movie, where the killer meets a guy at a, a bar, like this, this like leather bar. He meets him there, and they go back to his apartment. They have sex, and afterwards he ties the guy up. I mean, he he like the guy's laying there, no clothes on. The guy pulls a knife. The killer pulls a knife on him. And he hog ties him and he stabs him to death. In the stabbing, there's like a split second, like, you know, I've seen in Fight, Fight Club where Tyler Durden is like, like chopping together a movie. And for like a split second, he inserts a picture of a penis in the film. There's images like that when the killings happen. Like for a split second, there's an image spliced into the film. And you have to like rewind and pause just the right time to get a look at it. I didn't do that because, like, I didn't want to rewatch the killing. But, like, yeah, there's stuff like that. Uh, apparently, online, uh, it's been stated that those paused images are sex. And, like, people took offense to that because it was like, oh, this director's trying to equate, you know, sex with 
the like gay sex with the killing and whatnot but you know i don't know if that's what he was going for and i'm not gonna speculate on if it was but yeah the first kill it's it's like something out of a horror movie man it's 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 bloody it's it's not gory or anything but it's bloody it's hard to watch like leading up to it like you just get the feeling like man something something awful is gonna happen like once he pulls the knife on the guy and he puts it to his throat and the guy tell and the guy tells him like he's like now he's scared and like you just get this thing like oh man something awful you know he's gonna die but you know like he's gonna die in a very horrible way because his fucking knife is huge and he you know these flipped the guy over and tied him up so like he's totally vulnerable there's no way to defend himself and when he stabs him it's it's the thing is normally when a character gets shot in a movie it's nothing you don't really think anything of it like when a character gets shot in a movie it's like bam and they go down and that's that but when a character gets stabbed and the movie like it's different when a character gets stabbed because in an action movie when two characters are fighting and one of them gets stabbed they get stabbed and you move on to the next scene but when a camera lingers on it and it's a victim like of someone totally unable to defend themselves like getting stabbed in the back again and again and again it's like i don't know you almost don't want to see it you almost don't want to see it like and people are like i'm not squeamish like i said I'll, I'll watch a movie where a dude gets burned alive or dismembered or whatever and like oh that's okay that happened but it's a horror movie it's supposed to happen but like this isn't this isn't a horror movie but it, it may as well be dude the way this shit is filmed we we never get a look at the bad guy's face it's like like some michael myers shit you know like we never really we don't really know who this killer is we don't get a look at his face we, we do actually later in the movie when pacino goes undercover and he goes to that first bar we do look at the killer right in the fucking face but we don't know it's him we just think he's one of the many guys in the fucking bar but like yeah he's th- he's there but like in this film like he always got their sunglasses on and that kind of shit so yeah that's the thing going on here but this first kill man it's like it lets you know like yo this isn't this ain't the kind of movie you'd want to rewatch. you know like it's a good movie it's not a bad movie by no stretch of the imagination it's just a, a bad movie but it's just like it you know it's 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 got its, it's moments that are like okay I, I, it's one of those movies where you're like i was able to watch it but i don't want to see it again it's not a bad movie but i don't want to see it again i don't want to re-watch this killing or like the killings that happen in this movie like you know you don't want to see someone taken advantage of in that way it's like yeah essentially like, um after that the that's when the dude is like the chief the chief of police things comes up with the idea to send not to release like the captain you know like paul so if you know the captain he comes up with the idea to send this dude undercover to get him because apparently like oh this is the the like the third dude to wind up like this all the victims like have the similar mo you know they all look kind of the same like same height same similar weight same look to him so he sends in it by the way it takes 16 minutes for steve to show up i mean it takes 16 minutes of movie time for the main character to appear on screen like what the hell i mean what's going on here that it takes 16 minutes for the character to show you know he he's got a wife i think she's his wife or his girlfriend whatever the wife played by um marion ravenwood from indiana jones i don't know her name but like she was marion from the indiana jones and that first one that first one though it's not it's not temple doom it's not um last crusade that first one with the the thing the ark you know like the one with the ark of the covenant yeah that one she was married in that movie she reappeared in king of the crystal skulls but yeah yeah, yeah. you know she was the, she's in she's his love interest and um you know she was she was a there was this uh, shit dude but yeah she's just loving just but um yeah the movie has scenes where dude goes downtown and he starts hanging around like leather bars and looking around at the different places all the different people like the gay people whatever and i'm just curious were there really this many people out and about in full leather gear like 
leather jackets, leather pants, leather hats and shit in the 80s. Were there really this many people? Like, god damn, dude, there's, there's like 50 people out here. Okay, that's exaggerating. Like, there's, if there were 50 fucking people out there, like, okay, like, that's, uh, let's lower the number. There was like fucking 20 people outside just standing around in leather gear, like leather jackets, pants, and like leather hats and everything. I'm just looking like, oh man, what if this many people just out and about openly gay and shit in New York in 1980? Like, for real. Was this a thing? I asked because there was, um, there was this, there was this opening. Oh, the movie doesn't open with these killings, whatever. It opens on these two, I want to say drag queens. No, they're not, yeah, they're drag queens, but no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, like, they're not, they're cross dresses. Yeah, yeah, I'd say they're cross dresses, but like, the one that, that I don't, they look like women, but they're dudes. You know, they dress, they put on makeup, they dress up, they look women. Are they cross dresses? Are they, okay, let, let's just say, I don't know. Okay, there were these two, these two dudes, or these two women, I don't know. I can't, I don't want to say, the thing is, nowadays, in fact, then there was a word for everything, and you knew what that was. But nowadays, there's more exact words to use when to describe a member of a certain community. So the thing is, I don't know which word perfectly works here. Like, okay, let's call them drag queens. They were drag queens. They one they had like wigs, makeup, and they were two pretty very convincing women. I'm not gonna lie, they were very convincing women. Like, damn, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd fuck them. <laughs> uh, who am I kidding? If I did know, I'd still fuck them. They looked that good, like from the waist down. It was like holy shit. Like they had like these tights on. Like I don't know if they were like skinny. They were like skinny jeans, but I don't know if skinny jeans were a thing back then. So like, yeah, it was like that. They had like skinny jeans on, like black leather, like black tights, black high heels, black leather jackets, and these black hats and these like beautiful wig. The faces were all pretty and shit. And if you didn't know any better, you'd swear there were these two prostitutes just walking down the street. And these cops pull them over. Now, they pull them over. They, they don't really pull them over. The, the guy starts saying some shit. Like, just saying some random bullshit, offensive shit. And the one lady stops. And, you know, she, she says something to him. And she tries to keep walking. And he gets mad. And he's like, hey, come here. It's like come here and the whole time i'm watching i'm like don't don't just don't go over there this dude isn't like he's not charging with anything you don't have to go over there you can just keep walking like leave this asshole be don't go over there just because he says go over there but like you know like he's you just know he's gonna bust you on some trumped up charges or whatever just leave she even says like i can't afford another bust if you've been busted, like, more than once on bullshit charges, why do you keep listening to this fucker? Just leave. Ignore him. He's not gonna... He can't do shit if you ain't done shit. I mean, goddamn. But this is America. So, I mean, you can totally go to jail on, not, on no charges whatsoever. There is, like, a law somewhere that says cops can hold you for 24 hours, even if you haven't done anything. So, yeah, there's that. Oh, that's fucked up. But, like, yeah. So yeah, she's so the two the two drag queens wind up in the car. Like they get in the car, this is cop and his partner. They get in the car and they drive off to this like alleyway and they park there. Now the um, the way they end up sitting is this the older cop is sitting in the back seat with the two and his partner is sitting up front. And they make these jokes like, oh like like oh, I knew a guy, like he was a a corkscrewer, or a, like, a, like, I don't know, some dude, they're trying to say dude was a cocksucker, but like, but like going around about way of saying it, like a really jokey way, but like, this shit ain't funny, man. And then one guy, the guy sitting up front says, hey, come up here, let me show you my nightstick. It's like, it's like, bring your ass up here now. And, you know, they gets up out of the car, goes to the front, and we don't see what happened. We don't see what happens because then the movie cuts to the guy, the, the killer, going into the into this nearby club to find his victim. But later in the story, it's revealed that the one, the one drag queen who was there was is actually an informant for the cops. They didn't know that. The two cops who pulled him over clearly did not know that. But then, you know, the informant goes on to say like, "Hey, I'm being hassled by these two dudes. They pulled me over. 
and they made you know my partner give him a blowjob right in the front seat like like do something about it you know you, you gotta do something if i'm gonna keep informing for you you gotta do something about this shit then the guy the, the chief mentions like okay did you get their badge numbers did you get their names and it's like no you didn't get that but like like obviously she didn't get all that but like you know the chief says hey if you don't have badge numbers you don't have names like you don't got shit i, I can't help you i can't do anything if i don't know who's doing it so like oh they're from the sixth precinct or whatever the dude says they probably they weren't cops like then they weren't cops you know like there's because no like the way he was saying it's like no way a real cop would just pull you over and force you to give him a blowjob you know like that that shit doesn't happen except it totally did she's like there's plenty of people out there it's like there's more people pretending to be cops than there are actual cops is what he was trying to say that that's just not true dude like like there's more people pretending to be cops than there are cops thing is that's actually true in this movie i mean yeah he's he doesn't know that he doesn't know that he doesn't know that show he's just making up an excuse because like what he's hearing sounds so fucking ludicrous like what there's someone out there like there's cops out there making you give them blowjobs get the fuck out of here like that's not a real thing like get out of here like come back when you have something actionable like something i can you know charge people for or whatever and so yeah the he's right that does come back later on you know there's more people out there pretending to be cops than there are actual cops he's right there's a night when al pacino's character goes to a nightclub and it's precinct night and everyone in there is dressed head to toe in police paraphernalia man like what the fuck there really are more people dressed as cops than there are cops what the hell especially in this fucking movie shit i'm going on <clears throat> man though but yeah that's that b plot that never gets fucking resolved it just goes nowhere this it has that setup it has that continuation and then it goes nowhere it just fucking ends they're like what is that get the fuck out of here like come back when you have something extra i mean we see the informant later again when you know it provides further information on like a dude that the like, steve patino's character suspects of being the killer but you know other than that that's it like that the whole plot that be, that b plot that began the movie goes nowhere you know the cops i guess they get away with it we even see the the cop later on the you know the one of the cops who pulled the informant over we see him later on in the movie he's still copping around and he's still you know just oh he's at like a scene of a murder or whatever and we see him he's still got his badge he's still doing his thing and he runs into like the captain and the captain asks him like hey what prison are you from yeah i'm from the sixth you know like so it turns out this dude is an actual cop. Like this is this is he wasn't pretending to be a cop. He is a real cop. So yeah, but this like captain's not gonna know that. I guess this was like the director trying to resolve that plot point. You know, like like okay, like hey, here's some form of resolution. The resolution is that nothing happened. Nothing came of that. So the cuts in this movie are fucking weird. Okay. One cut, okay, wait, before that, like, when, when Pacino goes into these, like, clubs, this, like, uh, S&M joints, he goes in there, and initially when he goes there, he just, like, goes in there in his regular civvies, you know, he, he doesn't, he's, he's a fucking fish out of water, man, he's lost, like, just like, what, like, what am I, like, what's going on, he doesn't know what to wear, he doesn't know how to act, he's just like, I don't know he's just there man he's just there looking around he doesn't really know what to do he doesn't do anything he doesn't properly interact with anyone outside of the bartender or whatever to ask the question of hey who's that guy over there like what, what's up with that or what's going on just you know like typical police job he yeah, basically behaves like a cop you know he basically walks in and acts as if he were a cop and everybody you know treats him as such he's not truly one of them as much as he is just an outsider looking around like i don't know he was at the zoo or something you know that's i don't know that's just how it appeared you know that's how it appeared to me like he was just not in he, he was totally out of his element it's understandably so because he's not a gay guy he's a straight dude having to pretend to be gay in the most extreme manner possible this isn't a case of oh yeah just pretend to be gay like just say you like dudes or whatever no this is you can you have to pretend to be gay and also wear leather gear 
fucking you know, just do S and M shit. You don't have, like he didn't have to do S and M shit. That was never like one of the requirements. But it's like get into this community, like blend in to so that when the killer comes sniffing around, you know he'll think you're one of them. Like just be as close to one of them as you possibly can, so that when the killer comes around, he'll think you're one of them and he'll go for you and you'll be able to take him down. That's basically the premise. That's what they was going with. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, he looked fucking lost. Um, I wanted to mention there was uh, these different handkerchiefs that one could wear. Like, you could put them in your back pocket. Also, which pocket it was in kind of said whether you were a giver or a receiver. Like, uh, like certain handkerchiefs represented, oh, you like blowjobs, or you like anal sex, or... And which side, which pocket it was in, whether it was left or right, it was if you like to give blowjobs, you like to get blowjobs, you like to get fucked, you like to fuck, are you a hustler, like, you know, like, you know, like, are you a hooker or whatever, like, you know, shit like that, like, that's basically what it meant, it showed like, oh, there was this, um, like, language within, the... it really showed like there was a, a language, like, not a language, but like, there was, like, a, like, not secret code, but, like, there was a language within the community that only members of the community knew, and they knew what it meant, like, the different handkerchiefs mean this and that, like, red, yellow, green, whatever, mean different things, and it showed, like, oh, okay, a lot of thought and planning went into this, like, as it seems like, oh, actual research was done, you know, nice, nice, Plus, it takes um, a page out of the... It takes away that layer of awkwardness where you have to, like, ask somebody, so, like, what are you into? Them having a handkerchief in their back pocket, letting you know, like... And you know what the handkerchief represents? Like, oh, you don't have to ask anymore. You can just straight up walk by and say, hey, so you like so-and-so? Like, there was a scene in the movie where Pacino had a yellow handkerchief on and this guy walks up to him and he's got, like, these leather chaps on. The guy walks up to him and he goes... So, are you into water sports? I was like, and Virginia goes, Oh, no, uh, I just like to watch. And the guy gets mad. He's like, well, if you just like to watch, then take the handkerchief out of your pocket, asshole. And <laughs> after that scene, the, the cuts in this movie are fucking weird, okay? What cut? And like, that movie immediately, like, dude, okay, before that scene, this is a cut where, like, the... Steve is talking to his neighbor, you know, and it's it's in this diner. It's like, you know, it's during the day. It's so well lit. It's pleasant. They're just sitting together, eating lunch, talking. And then it cuts to him in the fucking leather ball, looking around, just standing with his arm crossed, looking around and all the dudes around him. And then from the leather ball, it cuts immediately after the, you know, take the handkerchief out of your pocket, asshole. Cuts to a scene of him working out like like a fucking Rocky montage with, like, music blurring in the background. Like, what the... <laughs> He's, like, getting in shape. He just... What the hell? <laughs> that dude didn't get mad at you because you weren't in shape, moron. He got mad at you because you had a thing in your pocket and you didn't do that. Like, just... Ugh, he, he, he felt like he got swindled, you know, like, I don't know, false advertising, whatever, that's why I do got mad, like, and, okay, I can kind of see the, oh, guys aren't attracted to me, because, like, they don't like how I look, let me get in shape, because everyone around me seems to be in fucking shape, so, like, you know, maybe that'll lure this dude out if I'm in better shape, or whatever, but, yeah, uh, um, <clears throat> In Indiana Jones, Marion yelled at Indy in this bar that they were talking in, like, I was the child, you know, because um, when they got in a relationship, she wasn't an adult yet. She was, like, still a teenager. So that was like, I was a child. It's like, well, she's all woman now. <laughs> she's not a child in this movie, man. And the sex scene that she has is proof of that. That's for damn sure. The movie doesn't have a problem showing this heterosexual sex scene. But it does have a problem when it comes to, like, the gay sex. Because it always finds some way to obscure it. You know, there's always, like, a... A bush or a shadow or something, or they film it at a weird angle where you have an idea what's going on, but you don't see what's going on. You know, like there's a scene where a character gives somebody a blowjob, and all we see is that character's feet standing in front of the guy, and then the other guy's hands reaching up and up, like from his feet all the way up. But we, the camera doesn't pan up with him, like we know what's going on, but we don't see it. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, for the, the second kill. The killer lures a guy out in the park and like they sneak in the bushes like this is like 
textbook cruising right here. They he, they meet the dude, in the, meet a guy. In the, cruising is basically when you meet a guy. In, the the movie title has a double entendre. It's when it's the act of cruising is when you go to a secluded area or a random area and you hang around looking for someone to have sex with. And this happens most likely in places like a park or you know yeah just basically cruising there. Or it also has to mean cruising as in the cops crew going on the lookout for crimes to stop. They're patrolling an area, you know, cruising. It works both ways here because it's a cop on the hunt for someone who, on the hunt for a killer, but it's, he's also cruising for a, like somebody to fuck who's also that killer. So it, it works both ways. Yeah. So the killer lures a guy into the park and he vanishes momentarily like he's fucking Batman. And there's nothing but bushes and shit all around. And he starts, you know, like singing this nursery rhyme. It's creepy as fuck, man. I think it's, that's when I'm like, William Friedkin was the right choice to direct this movie because the killings aren't just a killing and then the guy's dead. It's, there's this feeling of like dread. It's like, yo, man, you know something bad's gonna happen, but you don't know when. That's the thing. In a horror movie, you know something bad's gonna happen. And the tension comes into like, when is it going to happen and what's going to happen? In this movie, you know what's going to happen. And the tension comes into when is it going to happen? Like, this can happen now. Like, holy shit. Like, where's this dude going to pop out? Like, something like, where, did, where the fuck did he go? Where's he at? His voice seems to be coming from everywhere. And then he kills the guy. He stabs him to death like he did the previous guy. And it's, like I said, it's like something out of a slasher movie or like Halloween. He just stabs the guy with a fucking knife over and over. And he's like, you made me do that. And right away we get some idea, like, this man doesn't feel responsible for what he's doing. From his perspective, like, he's being forced to do this. Like, you know, like, just the very, the, like, the existence of these people, like, it's like, you, like, I had to do that. You made me do that. Like, Almost like he doesn't want to be a killer. Like he's a reluctant killer, but he still kills anyway. But what the fuck ever. That's that's not the here nor there. I'm not going to go into that just now. Um, Yeah. Every time the killer kills someone, he says, you made me do that. There's a scene. An, another killing happens in this, um, this like peep show. You know, because back in the day, you could you couldn't exactly watch porn at home. You know, DVDs and cassettes weren't, I mean, I think there were cassettes in the 80s, but they weren't like widely circulated with porn on them. So if you wanted to watch porn, you had to go to the cinema or you go to like a peep show, you know, you put money in and you, you know, sit in a room and you watch it there. So the two guys go, in. so this guy, like he gives a dude a look and we know this is the killer because we can, we know what he looks like now. We don't know his face, but we know the kind of shit he wears, like his attire and everything. So he gives the guy a look and we and they go into the peep show they start making out and as the the sex on screen is happening the sex on the peep show screen is happening the guy kills the dude that he was making out with puts a coin in the peep show and he leaves the locations for where the killings happen say something because all these locations are basically places where people go to fuck like the kind of places where like two gay guys might get it on a random place in the bushes a hotel a motel room and this peep show it's where people secluded places where people can fuck that's where he's killing people it shows that these killings aren't random you know like this, they may seem random like okay it's random in the sense that he's the person that the guy dude found that night but the location isn't random he the killer is killing people in places where he can do his thing and then leave without anybody looking at him sideways or anything because, well, the people coming and going in here, people who come and go in here aren't the kind of people who would look at the other people who come and go in here because they're kind of doing the same thing. I mean, they're not killing people, but like, you know, they're also having sex. But yeah, that's the, um, the gist of it all. That's so whatever. And he... In, in this movie, this scene, okay, like Al Pacino's character, he's finally he's got all his leather gear. He's at this bar, and he want he gets to look at this guy, uh, Skip, and he wants to go over there. And he even asks like, "Hey, who's that guy?" Bartends some, "Oh, like that guy's bad news. Like, don't go over there, man. He's not a good dude to be around. Like, uh, apparently he roughed someone up back in the day or whatever. Yeah, this shit like that. 
But before he can go over there and find out whether or not this dude is the killer, this other guy comes up to him and they dance and he like he's like, come on, come dance with me. They go over on the dance floor and they start dancing. And oh my god. <laughs> what is it with Al Pacino and this fucking dancing, man? Like what what is going on? <laughs> what the hell? What is it with Al Pacino and dancing in the 80s, dude? Like, I, I swear, man, Al Pacino dances better in, in Scarface than he does in this movie. And that was, people made fun of his freaking dancing in that movie. Like, hot damn, dude. I mean, if they saw this movie, they'd, I don't know, they'd have a freaking stroke. Damn. Jeez. What is this dancing, dude? Like, what? <laughs> <sighs> oh man, I know they say dance like nobody's looking, but damn, man. <laughs> oh man, whatever, but yeah. So I'm watching this film, and I'm like, moving in the. So, like, he tells the cops, yeah, there's this dude, his name is Skip, whatever, I need y'all to look into him. The cops talk to this informant, and they find out, like, where the dude works, and so they look into him. And they send these two guys, these two detectives to look into him. And right there, I'm just watching and I'm just thinking, like the cinema sense guy, I'm just thinking, oh, there's a discount. You know, whatever. The first time I heard that discount joke, it was during the Shaft movie. And I had like that kind of reaction where the dude was talking about like, oh, there goes like discount Christian Bale. Holy shit, that's actual Christian Bale. He was in Shaft. Like, that's what I saw when I saw a dude in this movie. Like, holy shit. I saw like one of the detectives, I was like, holy shit, that's Al Bundy from Married with, I was thinking like discount Al Bundy, but like, no, that's, that's real Al Bundy from Married with Children, holy soap, he's in, he's in cruising, <laughs> I freaking laughed, like I laughed so freaking hard, man, like what the hell, what the hell is Al Bundy doing here, <laughs> the heck is Jay from Modern Family doing in this movie, <laughs> what the, <laughs> oh my god, dude, Oh, that was hilarious. That, that got a chuckle out of me. Oh man, man, I, I, I don't. There's not a lot to laugh about in this movie. There's very little. There's freaking nothing to laugh about. But hot damn, dude, that that really really laughed, dude. Like holy soul, man. I'm funny is here. I mean, he's here. For, I thought like, oh, he'll be here for like a cameo or something. But nah, man, he's he's got a part. It's not a big part, but it's still a part. You're like, he's got a part in the movie. He's one of the detectives helping Al Pacino. And I'm like, hot damn, dude. Oh, this is such a sight to see him. This is like his his, his booty time cameo in in uh, Fort Fairlane, The Adventures of Fort Fairlane. You know, he comes out of, he just comes out of nowhere, talks to Fort, and he's like, booty time, booty time, across the USA. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is the same character. I don't know. Maybe it is. You know, he he didn't have a song to sing this time, but hot damn, it would have been interesting if he did. You know, they just I don't know. Maybe the events of this story or his experience in this world led to him to write the song "Booty Time." Who knows? <laughs> so Steve thinks that this guy Skip is the guy they're looking for. So he organizes. A, he works with the other cops to organize a sting operation on the guy. They. You know, he gets with the guy, they go up to a hotel room, and like, you know, he they have a Y in the room. Then he gets to get, tie him up like he did the other guys. And before he can do anything, the team's going to bust in and they arrest him. And like, bam, they got the right guy. That's the idea. The thing is, the Y craps out. Like, as the dude is talking about tying the other guy up, or talking people tying the team up, and like, since they can't hear what's going on, they're like, oh shit, let's get, let's get in there. Something must be going wrong. They rush in, and I kid you not, there are 12 cops in this fucking sting operation. 12 cops, all of them armed, and one of them has a freaking shotgun. All to arrest one dude with a knife. Just, <laughs> one dude. Like, you've heard of excessive use of force? Well, goddamn, that's, look, this is, not only that, but this is a serious waste, dude. 12 dude, 12 cops for one guy. Like, 12 of New York City's finest to arrest one guy in leather gear with a knife. Just one guy. Nah, man. It, 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 this, this shit is excessive, man. To an absurd degree, this is excessive. Dude, 12 cops and one of them's got a shotgun to arrest one guy. 
Like, this is ridiculous. God damn, man. I understand he's a serial killer. He's killing people. He needs to be taken down. But this is ridiculous, man. This is ridiculous. 12 people arrest one dude? Oh, shit. But anyway, so they bust him. The guy's like, he's like, did you see his knife? Did you see his knife? Like, when they come in to, like, rescue Pacino, like, did you see his knife? And they're like, nah. Like, what are you doing? You came in too soon. And, you know, he's right. Like, the, all they did was tie him up. All they got him for was tying dude up. It's not like he did anything. He didn't even have a knife on him, I think. You know, like, they just busted in on him, but whatever. It was too soon, so they interrogate the guy. And they grill the motherfucker. They think that he's the guy. They've got the right guy. Thing is, you know that that cliche, uh, the chief is clamping down on me to come up with answers thing. So they think he's the guy, he's their guy, you know, whatever. So, like, they ing this weird interrogation tactic happens, man. A weird interrogation tactic, and that is to <laughs> they, they while they're interrogating him, this big black dude. In a cowboy hat, wearing nothing but a cowboy hat and a jock strap, walks into the room and he smacks him. And then he walks out. And Steve is like, What the? He's like, Who, who is that guy? Like, what? The, realistically, that is how you'd react. You'd be looking around like, Who is that guy? Like, what the, what the heck was that? And everyone in the room just pretends like that didn't happen. Like, because realistically speaking, Nobody would believe you if you told them that's what happened. Like, the cops dragged me into the interrogation room, and then a big, half-naked black guy just walked in and slapped me. <laughs> like, that sounds insane. There's no way anyone would believe you if you told them that. So, I can see why they do that. But, God, but damn, man. This is just so out of nowhere. I was looking at the screen like, what the, what the heck was that? What, what was that? Did... Did I just, am I in the right movie? Like, this, <laughs> what movie did you walk in from, man? Damn. Uh, but yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so continuing on, dude, uh, uh, Steve, they, they realize, okay, he ain't our guy. We got to let him go. You know, we used our big black, you know, enforcer on the wrong dude. But yeah, they let him go. And, um... Uh, Steve Pacino's character goes back home, and his wife, his his wife's sole purpose in this movie is to have sex with him, and then moan when he doesn't. Like, like she's like, "Why don't you want me anymore?" Like, I mean, you think because he's a straight guy and hang around all these gay people all the time in these S and M balls and whatever, that when he gets to go back home and have sex with his wife, he would like screw her brains out or something. Like, he'd really be into it because. That's what he was doing the, the last time he was there. Like, he really went all in on love it over. Like, now all of a sudden, he's not feeling this woman. Like, he doesn't come home as often, and he's not feeling her like he used to. And she's been really like, why don't you love me anymore? Why don't you, we, we, like, we don't fuck anymore. We don't fuck anymore. That's, <laughs> that's essentially her character. Like, the one woman in this story isn't written very well. So... Yeah, your purpose is solely to screw the main character, and when he doesn't, to moan about it. So yeah, that's that. Ah, <sighs> but anyway, also Vegeta's character's name Steve. I've mentioned that over and over, but when I was watching the film the first time around, it took an hour for me to learn that Vegeta's character was named Steve. Holy soap! In the meantime, there's this B plot where like Steve is has neighbors with this uh, redheaded dude who's in an apartment. He's gay. And they just, like, talk about, like, everyday shit. Like, man, uh, my boyfriend wants me to get a job. And, you know, I'm but I'm writing a screenplay and it's taking up my time. He's like, the world can wait for whatever screenplay I have. But, like, we need to get a job. Like, like, but I need to get a job now or some shit like that. And he's grappling, trying to come to grips on whether or not he should do that. I think, like, that's the conflict. It This character works because he's... Um, uh, just a normal everyday dude it shows like not every gay person or member of the gay community is into snm stuff is a part of this scene some of them are just regular everyday gay folk you'd see walking down the street 
have ordinary jobs, live in an apartment, gotta pay bill, got bills to pay, stuff like that. It shows there is another side to this coin. It's not entirely one-sided. That's why I don't agree with the idea like, oh, this movie is trying to demonize the community. Like, no, it's showing an aspect of the community, but it's also showing that not everyone does this. If this character didn't exist and there was no character for like Pacino to talk to, and he, there was no ordinary dude who was just a member of the community, then then you could be like, oh, this is demonizing them because it's showing that all like all the gay people in this movie do S and M. There's not a single normal guy. Well, there is a normal guy in this movie. There's, there's two of them. Uh, you know, but one of them comes later. The other is the one is this like redhead dude Pacino's character talks to, and the other is James Remar. Like, what the fuck? Like, what is this movie? Like, I'm like, <laughs> he goes to visit, like, I mean, Pacino's character goes to visit his friend, and he, like, the door opens, and it isn't his friend, it's James Remar, with, like, long, flowing hair, he's, like, standing there, I'm like, holy crap, that's, that's Dexter's dad, that's freaking Raiden in, in Mortal Kombat Apocalypse, and he's, like, that's the original guy they cast for Hicks, I've been like, yo, he's here, where the rest of the warriors at, man? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, he's here for like one scene he um like gets in an argument with Pacino I don't remember what he said but it leads to like Pacino shoving him and they get in the apartment like they scuffle for a bit and he pulls the knife on the guy but I'm thinking like wait is the movie trying to say like he's the dude like he's got a knife cause he's got like the knife they said that the killer uses and he's like standing there threatening him it's like come on you wanna play like come on like it's basically his, come on, let's get nuts. Yeah, he was doing, come on, let's get nuts before Batman 89. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe Burton was watching this movie one time and saw this, like, come on, you want to play? And he's like, oh, like, let me let me put that in my movie. Like, I don't know what's going on. But, yeah, this, this movie is starting to, if you haven't noticed by my sudden change in tone, this movie is, like, picking up. Like, because no, it's like, hey, it's got to wrap up now. So, yeah, it's starting to pick up a lot. Whew. Anyway, uh, around this time, dude, uh, Pacino's character figures out, the finds this guy he suspects might be the killer. So he follows the guy all the way to his house after looking at yearbook photos. There's like a moment in the movie where he's talking to the captain. He's like, man, I can't do this no more. I can't, I can't do this no more. In the context of the film, he hasn't done anything. It's not like he's had to sleep with dudes or whatever there's one scene that insinuates that but there's nothing we've seen so him being like i can't do this anymore he's essentially saying i can't hang around gay people anymore like thing is it's never really established why it's just like i can't do this anymore we get like one scene where he's not feeling his wife like he used to but it's never explicitly said like that's what's going on it's just the movie wants you to think like okay he's not feeling his wife like just like he doesn't want to hang around them anymore because he finds their behavior too weird or maybe he himself is starting to turn gay and he doesn't want to like he's starting to have thoughts or whatever he doesn't say why he just says like i can't do this anymore i don't want to keep like i don't want to be doing this like i know there's a lot right on this i know we gotta find this guy but i don't want to do this anymore and he's like just hang in there man we need you like whatever and he does he hangs in there and he finds this dude he finds this guy and after looking through some yearbook photos, and he's like, oh, this dude might be the guy we're looking for. He might be the actual killer. After the guy leaves, you know, uh, the dude leaves. It's the dude we saw earlier. He was one of the dudes who was looking at Pacino. And, like, he actually is a killer. After Pacino's character breaks into his apartment, he finds these letters addressed to the guy's dad. The dad's been dead for years, but he writes letters to him, and he talks about him as if he was still alive. And the thing is, the guy has visions of his ghost dad, you know, talking to him and he's like trying to convince him like I, he's like i can't do this anymore like i understand like he basically saying i know this is like what you'd want me to do but like i, I don't think i can do this anymore like i don't want to be killing people he's a reluctant serial killer you know like he's a gay guy who's killing other gay guys because he feels that's i think like i think there's so much more you could have done with this character like have like don't have don't establish the hallucinations or him telling his ghost dad in one scene and then don't bring it up till the very end like have like do more with the killer like show like you know he still sees his dad like his dad is tormenting him and it's like a persistent voice in his head that's making him go out and kill these people and when he says you made me do that he's not talking to the victim he's 
talking to his fucking the ghost dad was messing with him. Don't actually have a ghost dad or whatever. Have it be um like in a manifestation of his like reluctance to accept his like self hatred and, and loath self loathing manifesting into a form and becoming this like figure that he associates with that, which happens to be his dad. Like, damn, I just came up with a better you know story for the villain than this movie did that came out like thirty years ago. But damn, I should have been a writer on this shit, man. Anyway, so yeah, that's that. Um, so Pacino figures out who the killer is, and he does this thing where he lets him know, like, hey, I know. It was like, it's like I was in your apartment. The guy knows he was in the apartment. He even goes to the window, and he sees Pacino outside looking right at him. Let him know, like, yeah, sucker, I was in your place. You know, and I read your letters. Like, I, it's like, I was in your place. So later on, he, like, this is when it gets weird. Because Pacino knows this guy is a killer. This guy knows Pacino knows he's a killer. And then when they meet, it's like if they're having a grinder date or something. It's like, so, you know, like they like they meet in the park. They're like sitting on a bench and it's like, hey, you got to smoke. And they start smoking. He's like, so, like, you want to do this? And like, yeah, you got a place? They're like, I got a place. Like, <laughs> look, the way he responds is like, like, fool, you know I got a place. You were there. But hey, we can't exactly go back there. Like, just, but yeah, you know, I got a place. And like, but like, okay, let's go, like, do it in the park. Let's go screw in the park. So, like, Pacino gets his pants off. And then, like, they're standing there. And the dude starts pulling his pants down. And he, then Pacino goes for the guy. The guy pulls his knife. And he winds up stabbing the dude. Like, Pacino straight up stabs the zero killer right in his freaking lungs. Before all this, I'm just thinking, wait, why doesn't Pacino call in the police? Like, it's like, hey, I know who did it. It's this dude. Come get him. Like, because, like, you know, whatever. So they stab the guy in his lung, mind you. He has a knife in his lung, and he goes down, and the movie cuts to black. But it cuts to the next day. I mean, like, these cuts are weird. It just cuts straight to the next day. Dude is laying in the hospital all bandaged up. He's got, like, a bandage right over his lung. And they're trying to get him to confess. And it's a fucking, it's a freaking miracle he's still alive, considering he got stabbed in the lung. Like, you need that to breathe. You can bleed out and die. How did he not bleed out and die? He's laying in a park in the middle of Greenwich Village or whatever, or New York. How did he survive long enough for an ambulance to get there with a knife in his lung? Just, oh, whatever. Oh, whatever. So he's like, I didn't kill anybody. And you know they're booking him. For, they're booking him for all the murders, and he's like, "I didn't kill anybody." But they're also gonna book him for trying to kill a guy. They tell him straight up, like, "Hey, the guy you attacked last night was a cop." So you may, and we know, like, um, we know, like, you killed all these people. So you just confess to it. You'll get less time. He's like, "I didn't kill anybody." In a way, like you could have framed this as he didn't kill anybody. He personally didn't kill anybody. It was. I don't know, him under the influence of his ghost dad that made him kill people so personally, it's like a dissociative identity thing, you know, he personally didn't kill anybody, but like, this version of him under the influence of this evil person in his life who's no longer alive is what made him kill people, so yeah, you, you could have had that, you could have had that, I mean, you could have totally made it, but then you'd have to dedicate more time to the killer, and like, this movie that wasn't gonna do that, so yeah, damn. Anyway, the movie uh, cuts to the killer's apartment after that. You know, they cut to his apartment where, like, Al Bundy and his partner are going through dude's things. And they find letters addressed to the guy's dad who's been dead for years. So the guy that keeps talking to earlier must have been in his head. Yeah, it shows, like, he's been writing letters, basically confessing all that he did. Like, as though that's when they find all the evidence to put the guy away. They're like, okay, this is the guy who did it. I mean, they don't know if this is the guy who's been hacking people to pieces and chucking them in the ocean, but, like, they know he's the guy who's been stabbing people. They can paint him for those bodies. But, um, afterwards, you know, like, hey, the captain says, hey, detective, you did a good job. You can go back to your normal life now. It's like, hey, thanks, you know, thanks for coming out, whatever. And he leaves. But he's got sunglasses on. I'm like, wait a minute. Where did he get sunglasses? And this is when the movie tries to pull something on you. Thing is, last time you saw somebody with sunglasses, it was the killer. The killer was the guy who had sunglasses and a leather hat. And then, after Pacino leaves, the captain gets called to the scene of a murder, and it's this apartment, 
the same apartment where the red-headed guy that Pacino was friends with throughout the movie, he lived. And he's been stabbed to death in his own home. The cops think it was like a crime of passion. Like his uh, love interest, James Remar, was the guy who did it. But like the movie's framing it like, hmm, um, maybe it wasn't. Because like he finds out that the guy, they find out that um the neighbor, his neighbor was Pacino's character. And the captain has this look. They don't, they don't explicitly say what's going on, but he has this look like, huh. So Pacino lived down the stairs from this dude, and now this dude is dead. Like, he's been like, like, how long has he been dead? And they think, like, okay, his partner did it, but, like, the captain's not so sure. The movie ends in a weird way. Like, he's back home, and Pacino's like, like, I'm, he tells his wife, like, I'm back, huh? And it's like, I'm, like, I'm not going anywhere anymore. Like, I'm back for good this time. And it ends with, like, him going for a shave in the bathroom while, like, his Marion Ravenwood tries on the... The leather jacket she found, the sunglasses, and the hat. And I'm sitting there thinking, whoa, this dude didn't have a hat. Patino didn't have, Patino had a leather jacket and the, and the denim pants and whatever. But he didn't have a hat and sunglasses. The killer had a hat and sunglasses. So, the, like, as she puts all this stuff on, he, he, like, stops shaving and he looks, he, like, turns his head so that his reflection is looking right into the camera. And then the movie fades to black before transitioning to a shot of the docks where, like, the, the bodies were found. And it, this ending is so confusing. It's just... Oh, dude. This ending is just so confusing because, like, is Steve a killer now? Did he kill the guy in dude's apartment? Is he gay? Did he have sex with the guy that he walked away earlier with in this scene? Like, the motivations of the killer weren't fully fleshed out. More could have been done with that character beyond just having him... Okay, I know I just said that, but like that was what I was thinking when I was writing the review. But like, I'm just saying more could have been done with the villain. Not enough was done. You know, not enough was done with the villain. It had an interesting premise that you could have done more with. But like, I get it. You couldn't go all the way. This was 1980. This wasn't today. People weren't exactly going to flock to the theaters to see a movie about like the gay community being haunted by a serial killer. And the kind of person who would... Like, who wasn't in the gay community may not be the kind of guy you want saying that they saw a movie. But anyway, aside from that, <clears throat> there was, um, yeah. All in all, the movie takes the cliche premise of a cop going undercover to catch a killer and gives it a unique twist of setting the story in the gay SM scene of 1980 New York. So I give the movie props for that. Also, I give the movie props for its visuals. There's a lot of scenes where, like, everything just looks. It's not like just following the thing. There's certain scenes are lit differently. The way the scenes are lit, the way music is used, the way the camera moves. I give the movie props for that too. So all in all, like I wanted to like give this an eight out of ten, you know. But like, dude, this more could have been done with the villain. The ending was confusing. The movie just the sort of ends. The, the who actually killed the dude? It's never a hundred killed the Pacino's friend. Was it Pacino? Was it a crime of passion? Like oh, who knows? It was never fully fleshed out. The movie just sort of ends. It uh, there is a like there's this discussion like um like the William Friedkin said like oh I, I had to cut like forty minutes of stuff that forty minutes of stuff would have you know explained everything. We don't know that for sure. Like, we'll never know because that footage is gone. Friedkin said it was destroyed or whatever by the studio. Who knows? It's just gone. But overall, you know, like, with all the things weighing this movie down, I give it a 7 out of 10. Yeah, I, I give it a 7 out of 10. <laughs> That's 7 out of 10 assless chaps. Yeah. This movie is a definite 7 out of 10. That has been my review of the 1980 Al Pacino starring William Friedkin directed movie Cruising. William Friedkin would go on to direct some better movies. Al Pacino would go on to star in better movies. But, I mean, better and worse. <laughs> Looking at you, John and Joe. But, yeah, but this movie was definitely unique. You know, I'll give it props. It was a unique film. There's no other films like it. And there weren't for the longest time until that one season of American Horror Story. But, yeah, that's that. This has been Moonlight Kingdom Reviews. Uh, farewell, dear Moonlight citizens. I will